the 9,556th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in the meeting. Ms. Sator Wensland, Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, and Mr. Christopher Lockyer, Secretary General of Medicine Sans Frontier. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Tor Wenislan. Madam President, members of the Security Council, as we approach 140 days of devastating war, there is still no end in sight. No end to the trauma of those impacted by the horrors unleashed on 7 October. No end to the suffering and desperation of the people in Gaza. No end to the regional turmoil. I was in Gaza this week to see firsthand the unfolding tragedy and to meet with our tireless and brave teams on the ground who face impossible challenges to deliver life-saving assistance to Palestinian civilians in the Strip. What I saw was shocking and unsustainable. I'm deeply concerned about a possible full-scale Israeli military operation in the densely populated Rafa area, where some 1.4 million Palestinians are sheltering and where we have the only point of entry of humanitarian goods. I cannot stress enough how urgently we need a deal that will bring about humanitarian ceasefire and the release of hostages. I reiterate my call for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and for a humanitarian ceasefire. In the meantime, I will continue to urge all concerns, including Israeli authorities, to address the key impediments to our humanitarian response on the ground. We need more safety measures greater security, and the tools and access points to scale up aid, particularly in the north of the Strip. I'm also continuing my extensive engagement in the region and internationally to both support all efforts towards a ceasefire and bring about a more common understanding and coordinated approach to address the complex humanitarian security and political crisis affecting us, not only Gaza, but the whole of the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel, and the region. <clears throat> I am convinced that there is no time to lose in laying a framework for Gaza's recovery and for long-term political solutions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including by advancing meaningful, irreversible steps towards a two-state solution. Madam President, according to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, from eight 18 January throughout 16 February, 4,327 Palestinians were killed and over 7,000 injured in fighting and Israeli operations in the Strip, bringing the total Palestinian fatalities in the war to more than 28,000, many women and children. The IDF has said that over 10,000 Palestinian fatalities are militants. In addition to the approximately 1,200 fatalities 7 October in Israel, Israeli Defense Forces reported 235 Security Forces personnel killed in Gaza since ground operation began. <coughs> Sorry. Of the 253 hostages kidnapped on 7 October, some 134 are believed to be still held hostage by Hamas. 112 have been freed and 11 bodies recovered. <coughs> 160 UN staff have been killed in Gaza, the largest single loss of life in the history of the organization. President, battles have continued across Gaza, including a campaign in Khan Yunis that began in late January and more recently intensified their strikes in the densely populated Rafa area. Hospitals, schools, and other protected sites continue to be severely impacted by military operations. 
The IDF has said that its forces are targeting Hamas fighters and equipment, as well as large-scale tunnel networks under these and other civilian infrastructure using, used for mili military purposes. On 15 February, the IDF entered Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis following days of shelling and sniper fire that killed 13 Palestinians. During a multi-day operation, IDF arrested over 100 Palestinians, including health workers, who they said were involved in militant activities, including the 7 October Hamas attack in Israel. While the World Health organizations evacuated some 50 critical patients, including children. More than 100 patients remained behind and seven were reportedly died after generators were shut on. Israeli forces said they were acting on information that Hamas had hostages in the facilities and were actively using the facility for military purposes. Palestinian armed groups continued to fire indiscriminate rockets from Gaza towards Israel or bite at reduced frequency and range. Madam President, let me return in more details to where I started this briefing, the desperate humanitarian situation in Gaza. IDPs face acute shortages of food, water, shelter and medicine. Communicable diseases are rising amid unsanitary conditions and over 2 million people face extreme food insecurity with women and children at greatest risk. This desperation and scarcity has led to a near total breakdown in law and order. Essential services have been heavily impacted by the fighting. 84% of health and education facilities are either damaged or destroyed. Over 62% of all roads and electricity feeder lines are unusable. My deputy and humanitarian coordinator has a plan to deliver the essentials, the food, the shelters, the medicine and water and sanitation, but our capacity to deliver depends on coordinated humanitarian movements, effective deconflictions with the parties and Israeli approvals for essential communication equipment and armored vehicles, all of which provide the minimum condition for staff to work safely. This must be improved. UN convoys and compounds must not be hit, and our equipment needs clearance fast. Keeping Gaza on a drip feed not only deprives a desperate population of life saving support, it drives even greater chaos on the ground and further impedes humanitarian delivery. On 20 February, World Food Program announced that it was forced to pause deliveries to northern Gaza following multiple security incidents. Convoy movements had just resumed two days earlier following a three-week suspension in the wake of a strike on the UN truck. For this reason, I renew our appeal to open additional access points to the northern part of Gaza to increase the flow of aid, reduce congestions in the south, and relieve some of the pressures on the population and the staff seeking to deliver. Madam President, Israel has provided information that 12 UNRWA staff were involved in the brutal attacks against the Israelis on 7 October. These allegations are appalling and such acts must be condemned. The Secretary General and UNRWA took swift actions including terminating employment of the 10 active staff members and launching internal and independent investigations. Nevertheless, Key donors have suspended aid, amounting to over half of the agency forecasted income for 2024. While we address the very serious allegations at hand, we must recognize that UNRWA remains the backbone of humanitarian response on the ground. I reiterate the ESD's appeal to donors to guarantee the continuity of UNRWA's operation, not only for Gaza, but for the stability of the region. Madam President, turning to the occupied West Bank, 27 Palestinians, including eight children, were killed by Israeli security forces, the majority in the context of Israeli operations in Area A, often including armed exchanges with Palestinians. 
On 30 January, an un undercover IDF unit killed three Palestinians inside a hospital in Jenin, one of whom was a patient. The IDF said that the three who were claimed by members of armed groups were planning an attack against the Israelis. During the reporting period, three Israelis, including one woman, was killed in Palestinian shooting attacks in the occupied West Bank and in Israel, including two at a bus stop on 16 February by Palestinians, who was also killed on the scene. In today's early morning hours, a deadly terror attack by three Palestinians against Israeli commuters near Mal Adumim settlement outside Jerusalem is yet another reminder of the boiling tension on the ground. Separate attacks against Palestinians and their property also continued. <clears throat> on 1st of February, US President Biden issued an executive order imposing sanctions on persons undermining peace, security, and stability in the West Bank. Four Israeli settlers have been sanctioned under the order, while the UK and France have also announced sanctions against settlers. Settlement activities also continued as Israeli authorities published tenders for approximately 420 housing units in Area C settlements. <clears throat> On 14 February, after an extended legal battle, Israeli authorities demolished the home of a prominent community leader in Al Bustan in occupied East Jerusalem, citing the lack of Israeli issued building permits, which are almost impossible for Palestinians to obtain. I am concerned that if the violence in Gaza does not end, the tensions and restrictions remain high in the West Bank, including at the holy sites in East Jerusalem. The holy month of Ramadan risks becoming another volatile marker rather than a time for contemplation and healing. I also remain deeply concerned about the economy of the West Bank and the PA's fiscal crisis. <clears throat> In this context, I welcome Norway's announcement on 18 February that an arrangement was reached with the parties to facilitate a partial transfer of the money clearance revenue, not included the amount Israelis say PA transfers to Gaza. <clears throat> I'm also encouraged that the Palestinian Prime Minister announced several judicial, security, administrative and financial reforms last month but more remains to be done. Madam President, in the international arena on 26 February, the International Court of Justice issued provisional measures in the case of South Africa versus Israel on the application of the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in, Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. I welcome the recent visit of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict to gather information on reports of sexual violence in the context of the 7 October attacks. Madam President, I remain gravely concerned over the serious risk for a further regional escalation. Across the Blue Line, exchanges of fire between Israel and Hezbollah continue to intensify with several civilian casualties reported in recent days. Approximately 100,000 Israelis and over 87,000 Lebanese are displaced from the communities. Firing from Syria towards the Israeli-occupied Golan and strikes by Israel against targets in Syria also continued, including Syrian claims of Israeli strikes on locations in Damascus and Homs. On 28 January, three U.S. soldiers were killed and over 40 injured in a drone attack on a U.S. military outpost in the northern part of Jordan. U.S. forces responded with strikes on targets in Syria and Iraq. Houthi forces continued to launch attack against vessels in the Red Sea, with strikes reported against Houthi targets in Yemen. Attacks against international shipping routes must cease immediately. I urge all relevant actors to take steps to immediately de-escalate. Madam President, in the scale of the emergency we are facing is staggering 
and could quickly spiral out of control in the region. I appeal for the collective coordinated and comprehensive response to not only address the immediate crisis before us in Gaza, but to help restore a political horizon for Palestinians and Israelis alike, while promoting greater stability and peace in the region. To do this, we urgently need a deal to achieve humanitarian ceasefire and the release of hostages. We need to create a space for moving forward through dialogue rather than violence. Ultimately, the long-term solution for Gaza is political. While taking into account Israel's legitimate security concerns, there must be a clear path towards restoring single, effective Palestinian governance across the OPT, including in Gaza. International support to strengthening and reforming the Palestinian Authority to improve domestic and international legitimacy will be crucial. To create the condition for this work, there must be a time-bound steps within a political framework to end the occupation to establish a two-state solution in line with relevant UN resolutions, international law and bilateral agreements. These efforts must coalesce and accelerate if we are to emerge from the nightmare into the trajectory that can provide Palestinians and Israelis with a chance of lasting peace. Thank you. I thank Mr. Wenesland for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Christopher Lockyer. Madam President, Excellencies, colleagues, as I speak, more than one and a half million people are trapped in Rafa. People violently forced to strip the, to the strip of land in southern Gaza are bearing the brunt of Israel's military campaign. We live in fear of ground invasion. Our fears are rooted in experience. Just 48 hours ago, as a family sat around their kitchen table in a health sheltering MSF staff and their families in Khan Yunis, a 120 millimeter tank shell exploded through the walls igniting a fire and killing two and severely burning, burning six others. Five of the six injured were women and children. We took every precaution to protect the 64 humanitarian staff and family members from such an attack by notifying warring parties of the location and clearly marking the building with an MSF flag. Despite our precautions, our building was struck not only by a tank shell, but by intense gunfire. Some were trapped in the burning building while active shooting delayed ambulances from reaching them. This morning, I am looking at photos that show the catastrophic extent of the damage and I am watching videos of rescue teams removing charred bodies from the rubble. This is all too familiar. Israeli, Israeli forces have attacked our convoys, detained our staff, bulldozed our vehicles, hospitals have been bombed and raided, and now, for a second time, one of our staff shelters has been hit. This pattern of attacks is either intentional or indicative of reckless incompetence. Our colleagues in Gaza are fearful that as I speak to you today, they will be punished tomorrow. Madam President, every day we are witnessing unimaginable horror. We, like so many, were horrified by Hamas's massacre in Israel on October the 7th, and we are horrified by Israel's response. We feel the anguish of those families, we, we feel the anguish of families whose loved ones were taken hostage on October the 7th. We feel the anguish of the families of those arbitrarily detained from Gaza and the West Bank. As humanitarians, we are appalled by violence against civilians. This death, destruction, and forced displacement are the results of military and political choices that blatantly disregard civilian lives. These choices have been, these choices could have been and still can be made very differently. For 138 days, we have witnessed the unimaginable suffering of the people of Gaza. For 138 days, we have done everything we can to enact a meaningful humanitarian response. For 138 days, we have watched the systematic obliteration of a health system we have supported for decades. We have watched our patients and our colleagues be killed and maimed. 
This situation is the culmination of a war Israel is waging on the entire population of the Gaza Strip, a war of collective punishment, a war without rules, a war at all costs. The laws and the principles we collectively depend on to enable humanitarian assistance are now, are now eroded to the point of becoming meaningless. Madam President, the humanitarian response in Gaza today is an illusion a convenient illusion that perpetuates a narrative that this war is being waged in line with international laws. Calls for humanitarian assistance have echoed across this chamber, yet in Gaza, we have less and less every day. Less space, less medicine, less food, less water, less safety. We no longer speak of a humanitarian scale up. We speak of how to, su to survive even without the bare minimum. Today in Gaza, efforts to provide assistance are haphazard, opportunistic, and entirely inadequate. How can we deliver life-saving aid in an environment where the distinction between civilians and combatants is disregarded? How can we sustain any type of response when medical workers are being targeted, attacked, and vilified for assisting the wounded? Madam President, attacks on healthcare are attacks on humanity. There is no health system to speak of left in Gaza. Israel's military has dismantled hospital after hospital. What remains is so little in the face of such carnage is preposterous. The excuse given is that medical, medical facilities have been used for military purposes, yet we have seen no independently verified evidence of this. In exceptional circumstances where a hospital loses its protected status, any attack must follow the principles of proportionality and precaution. Instead of adhering to international law, we see the systematic disabling of hospitals. This has left the entire medical, medical system inoperable. Since October the 7th, we have been forced to evacuate nine different health facilities. One week ago, Nazar Hospital was raided. Medical staff were forced to leave despite repeated assurances that they could stay and continue caring for patients. These indiscriminate attacks, as well as the types of weapons and munitions used in densely populated areas, have killed tens of thousands and maimed thousands more. Our patients have catastrophic injuries, amputations, crushed limbs, and severe burns. They need sophisticated care. They need long and intensive rehabilitation. Medics cannot treat these injuries on a battlefield or in the ashes of destroyed hospitals. There are not enough hospital beds, there are not enough medications, and not enough supplies. Surgeons have had no chance, no, surgeons have had no choice but to carry out amputations without anesthesia on children. Our surgeons are running out of basic gauze to stop their patients from bleeding. They use it once, squeeze out the blood, wash it, sterilize it, and reuse it for the next patient. The humanitarian crisis in Gaza has left pregnant women without medical care for months. Women in labor cannot reach functioning, functional delivery rooms. They are giving birth in plastic tents and public buildings. Medical teams have added a new acronym to their vocabulary, WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Children who do survive this war will not only bear the visible wounds of traumatic injuries, but the invisible ones too. Those of repeated displacement, constant fear, and witnessing family members literally dismembered before their eyes. These psychological injuries have led children as young as five to tell us that they would prefer to die. The dangers for medical staff are enormous. On a daily basis, we are making the choice to continue working despite the increasing risks. We are scared. Our teams are beyond exhausted. Madam President, this must stop. We, along with the world, are closely watching how this council and its members have approached the conflict in Gaza. Meeting after meeting, resolution after resolution, 
this body has failed to ad effectively address this conflict. We have watched members of this council deliberate and delay while civilians die. We are appalled by the willingness of the United States to use its powers as a permanent council member to obstruct efforts to adopt the most evident of resolutions, one demanding an immediate and sustained ceasefire. Three times this council has, has had an opportunity to vote for the ceasefire that is so desperately needed, and three times the United States has used its veto power, most recently this Tuesday. A new draft resolution by the United States ostensibly calls for a ceasefire, however this is misleading at best. This council should reject any re resolution that further hampers humanitarian efforts on the ground and leads this council to tacitly endorse the continued violence and mass atrocities in Gaza. The people, of, uh, the people of Gaza need a ceasefire, not when practicable, but now. They need a sustained ceasefire, not a temporary period of calm. Anything short of this is gross negligence. The protection of civilians in Gaza cannot be contingent on resolutions from this council which instrumentalize humanitarianism to blur political objectives. The protection, the protection of civilians, of civilian if, the protection of civilians, of civilian infrastructure, of health workers and health facilities falls first and foremost on the parties to the conflict. But it is also a collective responsibility, a responsibility which rests with this council and its members as parties to the Geneva Conventions. The consequences of casting international humanitarian law to the wind will reverberate well beyond Gaza. It will be an enduring burden on our collective conscience. This is not just political inaction, it has become political complicity. Two days ago, MSF staff and families were attacked and died in a place they were told would be protected. Today, our staff are back at work, risking their lives once again for their patients. What are you willing to risk? We demand the protections promised under international humanitarian law. We demand a ceasefire from both parties. We demand the space to turn the illusion of aid to meaningful assistance. What will you do to make this happen? Thank you, Madam President. I thank Mr. Lockyer for his briefing, and I will now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Special Coordinator Wensland, for your briefing. Madam President, we all want to see a durable end to this conflict. The best way to advance in enduring peace and Israel's security is to support the creation of an independent Palestinian state side by side with Israel. The realization of this vision, however, continues to face numerous obstacles, several of which we have heard about in today's briefing by the special coordinator. These obstacles include Hamas and other groups' continued holding of 134 hostages. I've said it before, and I will say it again. There can be no sustainable ceasefire in Gaza without the hostages being released. After five months of fighting, this is clear. Colleagues, the pace of hostage talks can be frustrating. They are complicated by practical considerations, and as we all know, negotiations at such practical considerations, and as we all know, negotiations at such to achieve a positive result that would bring the hostages home and result in a six-week-long cessation in fighting. I also share your profound concern for the well-being of the more than one million Palestinian civilians in Rafah. President Biden and Secretary Blinken made clear to Israel that under current circumstances, a major ground offensive into Rafah would result in civilian harm and displacement, including potentially into neighboring countries, which would have serious implications for regional peace and security. As such, we have underscored that such a major ground offensive should not proceed under current circumstances. These statements are a clear signal. Israel should not proceed with an operation that we know will create more suffering and worsen the humanitarian crisis in the absence of a viable plan to protect civilians. 
We all want to see a durable end to this conflict, and there are three key elements I'd like to highlight. A temporary ceasefire conditioned on an agreement to release the hostages is the first step. Again, this is the best path forward. Protection of civilians. Again, we have communicated our concerns to Israel quite clearly. We need better deconfliction and coordination mechanisms so that humanitarian personnel can perform life-saving work, a point that was reinforced today by the Special Coordinator. We cannot forget that 1.5 million civilians in Rafah and other civilians across Gaza would not be in harm's way right now if Hamas abided by the laws of war, did not embed itself with civilians, did not hide in tunnel complexes beneath hospitals and schools, and did not engage in other atrocities. Hamas's violations of international humanitarian law and its abuses against the civilian population in Gaza also in no way lessen Israel's responsibility to do everything possible to protect the civilian population. And finally, full implementation of Senior Coordinator Cog's plan to accelerate the delivery of humanitarian aid at scale. That includes opening additional crossings for delivery of aid and commercial goods and keeping currently available crossings open. Here, again, the United States has been clear with Israel about the need for urgent and specific steps to increase the throughput and consistency of humanitarian assistance. Colleagues, let me close by emphasizing what Ambassador Thomas Greenfield noted the other day. Namely, the United States stands ready and indeed has begun negotiations on a council product that supports diplomacy on the ground to bring about a sustainable end to this conflict. Moreover, the United States will continue to press the parties to reach a deal that would bring the hostages home and allow for an extended six-week temporary ceasefire. Council support for this diplomacy is critical to increase pressure on Hamas to accept the agreement on the table. Securing that agreement and successfully implementing it is how we lay the foundation for a durable peace. This is critical for Palestinian civilians in Gaza whose family members have been killed whose homes have been destroyed, who have been displaced multiple times, and who wonder where they'll find their next meal or when and where the next airstrike will land. It is critical for the families of hostages, mothers and relatives who don't know whether their children are alive, injured, or deceased. It is critical for Israelis, many of whom are still displaced or face barrages of rocket fire. It is critical for Palestinian civilians in the West Bank who face record levels of violence by extremist settlers, violence that we unequivocally condemn. It is critical for humanitarian workers and journalists who put their lives on the line every day to do their jobs and to help us do ours and must be protected. And it is critical to everyone who desperately wants to see sustainable peace in this region. We welcome the support of Council members for ongoing diplomacy and thank the UN for its ongoing efforts toward a sustainable end to this tragic conflict. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Madam President, we wish to thank the briefers for their objective assessments of the catastrophic situation in the Gaza Strip particularly the direct, the direct frank and blood-curdling testimony from Mr. Lockyer. What can be added to those words? Can we even bear to hear more? Madam President, today's meeting is taking place against the backdrop of yet another veto exercised by the United States, a veto against the draft resolution of the Security Council for an immediate ceasefire in the Strip. 
оправданий для таких действий американской делегации нет. Is no justification for the American delegation for such action. There is no justification. There can be no justification for this. The unprecedented levels of violence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict zone has been ongoing for 140 days now. The colossal figures, figures of losses and devastation, which we heard about from the briefers today, speak for themselves. More than 29,000 people, including women, including children, have fallen victim to the indiscriminate bombardment and Israeli military operations. At least 69,000 people have been wounded and horrific injuries. These are horrific injuries, as we have already heard today. 80% of the entire population of the Strip have now become internally displaced persons, the majority of whom have found refuge in the south of the Strip in the cities of Khan Yunus and Rafa, which are effectively besieged. The Israeli Air Force has been aggressively bombing them. We are effectively talking about a deliberate policy of Western Jerusalem to expel the Palestinians from Gaza, the consequences of which will inevitably result in the Gazans breaching the border with Egypt and the humanitarian disaster will then spill over onto Egypt's soil. The so-called diplomatic efforts of Washington on the ground, which uh, our U.S. colleagues have been so increasingly vocal about, these incantations have thus far had no effect whatsoever. It is clear that real leverage over the Israeli government is something which Washington simply does not have. The Western Jerusalem authorities have been categorically stating that the cleansing of the Strip apparently will continue for, yet, for more months. They have been issuing calls to continue the military operation to eliminate UNRWA's presence in the Strip and to violently and forcibly displace the Palestinians from their homes. At the same time, it is also clear that despite the bravado, Israel has been failing to achieve its stated objectives. The Israeli military operation, judging by open source information has not helped and will not help to release the hostages. Against this backdrop, the statement by the U.S. representative about a ceasefire not being able to take place without the release of hostages seems doubly cynical. This release of hostages cannot take place without a ceasefire. So what we are observing is the impasse of unbridled escalation where thousands upon thousands of Palestinians are becoming victimized. At the Security Council, there's an effective consensus about the need to end this violence. The path to multilateral efforts under the aegis of the United Nations is blocked merely by one delegation, that is the United States of America. By shielding its Middle East ally, the U.S. is attempting to sell as, alternative, as an alternative solution to sell the Security Council's blessing for a solution which is advantageous to Israel alone, or more precisely, advantageous for the United States geopolitical agenda in the Middle East. All United Nations structures, led by Secretary General Guterres, have been unanimously stating that there is a need for an urgent human humanitarian ceasefire as the prerequisite for the establishment of humanitarian assistance at the necessary level and the establishment of conditions for the release of hostages. This specific demand to the parties was the cornerstone of the draft resolution authored by the delegation of Algeria, which the United States vetoed. Colleagues, by blocking Security Council resolutions time after time and arrogantly calling on the Security Council not to interfere with your diplomacy, you are doing yourselves a disservice instead of allowing the Council to leverage the resources at its disposal to exercise its authority. You are increasingly losing control over the situation. You are giving the green light for the continuation of the aggression against the Palestinian people including for the conduct of the ground operation in Rafah.
тупиковая ситуация в Совете Безопасности порожденной твердолобой Госпожа Которые были немедленно уволены Призываем We call for the decision for the suspension of financing for UNRWA to be reconsidered. The collective punishment of millions of Palestinians in need of assistance is simply amoral. It cannot be viewed as anything other than donor blackmail and the politicization of humanitarian issues. For in fact, this means a worsening of the suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza, including as a consequence of the disruptions in the delivery of humanitarian assistance, as well as educational and social services, health care for approximately 6 million Palestinians on the entire occupied Palestinian territory, as well as in Jordan, in Syria, and in Lebanon. In this connection, we condemn attempts to discredit UNRWA and the pinning of political labels on its operations. For our part, the Russian Federation reaffirms our position in principle. This protracted, decades-long conflict has no military solution. The only way to resolve this conflict is exclusively through political diplomatic means under the two-state formula. We consistently advocate a humanitarian ceasefire as the sine qua non for the delivery of unfettered humanitarian assistance to all people in need and the unconditional release of all hostages. This is an imperative which all of the efforts of the Security Council should be focused on. We urge all to heed the calls of the Arab Muslim world and the overwhelming majority of the international community who have been demanding for an end to be brought to the suffering of peaceful civilians in Gaza and the Middle East. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Malta. Thank you, President. I also thank Special Coordinator Wenesland and Mr. Chris Lockyer from Edson San Frontier for their frank briefings. Mr. Lockyer, sincere condolences for the loss of lives of your colleagues. Too many humanitarian workers and UN workers have perished in this conflict so far. I thank you also for your courageous decision to brief, to brief us at this critical time. At the outset, I underline the fact that any reprisals are unacceptable. As a council, we must make this clear to all sides. Malta has repeatedly and unequivocally condemned the Hamas terror attacks of 7th October. We reiterate that the immediate and unconditional release of hostages must be a top priority. However, the scale of human suffering that continues to unfold in Gaza due to the ongoing hostilities is appalling and deeply consternating. We regret that two days ago this Council once again failed to call for a permanent ceasefire. 
The Israeli government's announcement that it will be advancing its ground offensive into Rafah is extremely alarming. This area, designated as a safe zone, is sheltering half the population of the Strip, including over 600,000 children and their families. We are gravely concerned at Israel's plan to displace this acutely vulnerable population. This will only serve to perpetuate the forced displacement of Palestinians and further inflame regional tensions. President, we have already heard this morning of the medical and humanitarian consequences of this relentless assault on Gaza. 30,000 people have already been killed as a result. 12,000 are children. Not a single medical facility remains fully functioning. Reports from the WFP and FAO attesting that acute malnutrition is causing signs of physical wasting in children under the age of five speaks volumes. Over half a million Gazans are in famine-like conditions due to the induced state of food insecurity. This humanitarian crisis in Gaza needs to be urgently addressed. Israel is required to facilitate the full and unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid into Gaza, which continues to fall short and to facilitate the effective humanitarian deconfliction mechanism. Further crossing points need to be reopened to allow adequate scaling up of aid, particularly in the north of Gaza where conditions are reportedly even more dire. President, Malta calls for the full implementation of Security Council Resolutions 2712 and 2720. This remains the bare minimum required. In this vein, we fully support the Special Humanitarian Reconstruction Coordinator in her mandate. We also call for the immediate implementation of the Order on, of provision, the order on Provisional Measures issued by the International Court of Justice on 26 January. UNRWA's presence also remains essential. Funding cuts to the agency will cause immediate repercussions. It is in this vein that Malta has issued a further contribution to UNRWA and we encourage others to do the same. President, in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem, attacks by the IDF and violent settlers on unarmed Palestinians threaten to push the occupied territories over the brink. We unequivocally stress that settlements are in violation of international law and their continued expansion must stop. Malta also remains deeply concerned about the escalation of hostilities across and beyond the Blue Line. We urge all concerned to stop the cycle of violence. De escalation and restraint are critical. We reiterate that an immediate ceasefire in Gaza must be agreed to allow the necessary space for a diplomatic resolution to this conflict. This needs to include a revitalized Palestinian Authority, which has the agency and legitimacy to govern the people of an independent Palestine, including Gaza, in line with the two-state solution. Thank you. I thank the representative of Malta for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Japan. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. I thank Special <coughs> Coordinator Winesland and Mr. Chris Lockyer, Secretary General of Medicine Sans Frontieres, for their variable briefings. Madam President, nearly 140 days have passed since Hamas and others' uh, ad ad adhorrent acts of terror against Israel took place. We reiterate our unequivocal condemnation of this heinous act and call for the immediate and unconditional release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas and other groups. 140 days of hostilities are also far too long to bear witness to. Reportedly, nearly 30,000 Palestinians have lost their lives, 75 of the population displaced and estimated 70% of homes destroyed or damaged. Japan is deeply concerned about the Israeli military offensive into Rafa, where almost 1.5 million people are sheltering. The humanitarian situation in Gaza has been a nightmare for too long. 
It is also regrettable the World Food Program has to pause food deliveries to northern Gaza despite widespread starvation and disease. To meet the enormous humanitarian requirements, more coordination between relevant parties is necessary. We also need more trucks and fuel inside Gaza to ensure consistent and pre predictable aid delivery. We urge Israel to open additional border crossings and secure humanitarian corridors so that the humanitarian actors can safely carry our, out their work. We strongly support the efforts of UN senior coordinator Ms. Sigrid Kag to overcome the many impediments to reaching those in need. In this vein, Japan reiterates that the humanitarian ceasefire needs to be realized promptly in such a way as to ensure a con conducive environment for sufficient humanitarian assistance activities as well as to lead to release of remaining hostages, therefore resulting in the realization of a sustainable ceasefire. The Security Council was unable to adopt the resolution two days ago, but our collective endeavor must continue. We also express deep appreciation for the ongoing four-party diplomatic talks, hoping that they swiftly bear fruit. Madam President, the conflict is already spreading over across the region, from Israeli settler violence in the West Bank, intensified hostilities between Hezbollah and Israel, and to provocative act attacks against vessels by the Houthis in the Red Sea. We cannot afford a wider conflict conflict which would reverberate around the world. All parties must abide by international law, including international humanitarian law, and observe in good faith relevant Security Council resolutions. Japan takes the allegations made against, made against UNRWA seriously. At the same time, we also understand its services are vital to Palestinians across the region. We therefore hope the independent investigations now underway will efficiently and swiftly concluded, and the agency will take appropriate measures, including strengthening its governance, in order to restore the trust of the international donors in a sustainable way and broaden donor basis. Japan will continue to work with other council members toward regional stability. It is high time that we, need, we heed many calls to save lives, including from the ICJ in its, illegal, in its legally binding order on the provisional measures. To conclude, I would like to stress that de-escalation and the humanitarian ceasefire are prerequisite for the ultimate goal that we all wish to see, which is two independent states, Israel and Palestine, Palestine living side by side in peace and security. I thank you. I thank Madam President. I thank the representative of Japan for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President, and thank you, Special Coordinator Wenesland, for your briefing today. Mr. Lockyer, I join others in offering condolences to the families and friends of those who have lost their lives, and also I salute the courage of those who have decided to stay. Your briefing to us was harrowing and your message was unequivocal and clear, and I thank you for that. Colleagues, we all know that Palestinian civilians are facing a devastating and growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We want the fighting to stop now. But simply calling for a ceasefire now doesn't make it happen, and it won't make it sustainable. That is why we're calling for an immediate suspension in fighting to get aid in and hostages out and then progress towards a sustainable, permanent ceasefire without a return to destruction, fighting and death. That means the release of all hostages the formation of a new Palestinian government for the West Bank and Gaza, accompanied by an international support package, removing Hamas capability to launch attacks against Israel, Hamas no longer being in charge of Gaza, and a political horizon 
which provides a credible and irreversible pathway toward a two-state solution. Current negotiations are critical to secure the release of the hostages held in Gaza, as well as progress towards our shared objective of a sustainable ceasefire. The UK Government continues to work intensively with partners across the region to support this, and we call on all actors to do the same. President, we are gravely concerned by the prospect of an Israeli offensive on Rafa, which would have disastrous consequences for the civilians sheltering there with nowhere else to go. Over half of Gaza's population are sheltering in the area, and the Rafa crossing is vital to ensure aid can reach the people who so desperately need it. That is why the immediate priority must be a suspension in fighting, which is the best route to secure the safe relief of hostages and significantly step up the aid reaching Gaza. We're also gravely concerned that the UN World Food Programme has had to pause deliveries of food aid to northern Gaza. We continue to stress the need for Israel to support the UN to distribute aid effectively across the whole of Gaza, including in the north, as the special coordinator referred to. And for Israel to open more crossing points into Gaza. Nitzana and Karem Shalom must be open for longer. Israel must also ensure effective deconfliction in Gaza and take all possible measures to ensure the safety of medical personnel and facilities. As we approach Ramadan, we urge all parties to call for calm and not inflame tensions around the holy sites. We call on everyone to respect their sanctity and security. Now, more than ever, we need to generate momentum towards a permanent peace. And the UK will continue to work intensively in support of a two-state solution which guarantees justice, peace and security for the people of two states, Israel and Palestine. I thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Et thank you, mes Madam President. Like my colleagues, I would like to thank Special Coordinator Tor Venesland and Chris Lockyer for their presentations, uh, which can hardly Nous leave us indifferent. Par les we are appalled by the recent attacks in Al Mawasi, where family members of MSF tués. staff were killed. These fatalities add to the growing number of victims that we have to mourn. I express my sincere condolences to the families of all the victims and to your organization, and let me express my admiration for all humanitarian workers remaining there to work under these circumstances. It is our duty as members of the Security Council to reaffirm our commitment to the principle of humanity, which is today being severely tested in the Middle East. This principle underpins the rules of international law, in particular international humanitarian and human rights law, and binds us together in our common essence. We regret, therefore, the failure to adopt a resolution calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Aujourd'hui, on l'a entendu dans la bande de Gaza, plus de 75% de la population est déplacée. Des centaines de milliers de civils sont assiégés et font face à la famine, famine et aux épidémies. La plupart à Rafa, refuge pour plus d'un million de civils fuyant les combats et un conduit vital pour l'aide humanitaire à Gaza. La Suisse est profondément préoccupée par les conséquences humanitaires catastrophiques que pourrait avoir une large offensive militaire d'Israël à Rafa, tant directement 
pour la population civile que pour l'acheminement de l'aliment. Nous condamnons le fait que les hostilités continuent de faire de nombreuses victimes parmi les civils à Gaza. Nous comptons aujourd'hui près de 30 000 personnes tuées, dont une majorité de femmes et d'enfants. En quatre mois, les bombardements répétés de zones urbaines densément peuplées ont détruit 70 des infrastructures civiles à Gaza. Nous réitérons aussi notre ferme condamnation des actes de terreur et des attaques indiscriminées du Hamas dès le 7 octobre et nos appels répétés à la libération immédiate et inconditionnelle des otages. Le droit international humanitaire interdit les prises d'otages et exige à ce que les personnes hors de combat qui soient détenues, blessées ou malades soient traitées avec humanité. La Suisse appelle toutes les parties au conflit, conformément à l'article 1 commun aux conventions de Genève, au strict respect, respect du droit international humanitaire et à prendre les mesures concrètes pour épargner et protéger la population civile. Cela comprend notamment les principes fondamentaux de distinction, de proportionnalité et de précaution dans la conduite des hostilités. Dans ce sens, la Suisse rappelle également que les tirs de roquettes indiscriminés sont interdits par le droit international humanitaire. Il est important de de réitérer que les unités sanitaires telles que les hôpitaux doivent être respectées et protégées en toutes circonstances. Elles bénéficient d'une protection spéciale sous les conventions de Genève, article 20. Elles ne doivent pas faire l'objet d'attaques ni être utilisées en dehors de leur fonction humanitaire pour commettre des actes nuisibles à l'ennemi. Nous sommes profondément préoccupés par les conséquences de l'effondrement du système de santé dans la bande de Gaza sur les civils, dont près de 70 000 personnes blessées. Selon l'article 55 de la 4e Convention de Genève, je cite, « La puissance occupante a le devoir d'assurer l'approvisionnement de la population en vivres et en produits médicaux. Cela doit être fait maintenant. » À cet égard, la Cour internationale de justice a été claire. Israël doit prendre sans délai des mesures effectives pour permettre la fourniture dans toute la bande de Gaza des services de base et de l'aide humanitaire requise de toute urgence. La Suisse rappelle à Israël qu'il doit se conformer à l'ordonnance de la Cour et prendre notamment les mesures nécessaires à ce sens. Nous l'avons entendu, les opérations d'aide humanitaire déjà fragilisées ne peuvent être maintenues à flot sans garantie de sécurité adéquate et sans accès suffisant pour le personnel humanitaire. À court terme, nous ne voyons pas d'alternative à l'UNRWA pour sauver des vies, offrir un abri et organiser l'assistance aux civils à Gaza. À la suite des accusations graves dont certains employés de l'UNRWA font l'objet, nous attendons des enquêtes indépendantes qu'elles jettent toute la lumière sur ces allégations et appelons à toute coopération nécessaire à cette fin. Madame la Présidente, Madame Présidente, nous devons travailler dès maintenant à la protection des civils déplacés à l'intérieur de la bande de Gaza. Celle-ci doit faire partie intégrante du futur État palestinien vivant côte à côte avec Israël en paix et en sécurité. La Suisse reste à disposition pour soutenir les efforts diplomatiques sur le terrain. Cesser le feu humanitaire à Gaza est nécessaire, aussi pour parvenir le plus rapidement possible à une désescalade au niveau régional. Nous nous tenons prêts à coopérer avec tous les membres du Conseil pour trouver un consensus à la recherche d'une solution qui puisse mettre fin à la souffrance humaine et relancer les perspectives de paix. that he painted of Gaza for us can touch the conscience of a certain member of this council. The veto by the United States two days ago meant this council missed yet another opportunity to push for a ceasefire in Gaza. The continuation of the conflict, even for another day, would cause even more civilian casualties and, leading, and lead to a greater catastrophe. An immediate ceasefire in Gaza is an urgent imperative to save innocent lives and to prevent a wider war. 
an immediate ceasefire is the common wish voiced by the international community and the consensus of the Council's overwhelming majority. We are aware the United States has tabled a new draft resolution. We hope the U.S. will show a responsible attitude, respond positively to the international voice, and respect the established consensus among council members. We need to point out that the essence of any action, ac action of this council is to achieve an immediate ceasefire. Any message sent out via our action must be clear, unequivocal, unambiguous, and unmistakable, rather than prevaricate or beat about the bush. At this point, the Council needs to demonstrate a strong resolve rather than wield negotiating skills only. Madam President, more than four months has passed since the conflict in Gaza began. It is the bounden duty of this Council to slam on the brakes to head off a greater calamity. The military offensive into Rafah must cease immediately. Over 1.5 million Gazans are packed into Rafah, having nowhere else to go. Escalated Israeli military incursions into Rafah will result in unthinkable civilian casualties and humanitarian disasters and cause irreparable damage to regional peace. We strongly oppose such actions. Israel should immediately cancel its plan to attack Rafah and halt its collective punishment of the Palestinian people. The International Court of Justice requires that the provisional measures is issued to prevent genocide be effectively implemented without delay. It is imperative to ensure sufficient unimpeded humanitarian deliveries into Gaza. As Gaza is becoming a death zone. Millions of people in Gaza lack the basic necessities for survival and are languishing in hunger, in disease, and in despair. Meanwhile, humanitarian relief is hampered by man-made barriers, so much so that it's becoming unsustainable. The World Food Programme announced that it had been forced to suspend its assistance to northern Gaza because of security threats. Right now, Security Council Resolutions 2712 and 2720 must be fully implemented. Israel must take concrete action to open all land, sea, and air routes into Gaza, provide all that is required by humanitarian agencies for their relief operations, and ensure the safety and security of the staff and facilities of humanitarian agencies. The UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East, UNRWA, plays a vital role that is indispensable and irreplaceable in alleviating the humanitarian plight in Gaza, and we call on the donors concerned to resume funding to the agency as soon as possible out of humanitarian considerations to keep the lifeline for the people of Gaza alive. All parties should give their full support to the work of Sigrid Karg, UN Senior Humanitarian and Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza. Every effort must be made to prevent the conflict spilling over to the wider region. Right now, the Middle East is in turmoil. Exchanges of fire between Lebanon and Israel, between Syria and Israel, are escalating. Tensions in the Red Sea are continuing, and the specter of a wider war is looming over the Middle East. We call on the parties concerned, especially those with significant influence, to exercise calm and restraint and to refrain from acts that would aggravate the tensions. Parties should endeavor to stop war through peace and break the vicious circle where violence is repaid with violence and the swivel door of conflict doesn't stop spinning. The political horizon afforded by the two-state solution must be given a new lease on life. Independent Palestinian statehood is not a gift given by one party to another in charity, but an inalienable, inalienable right of the Palestinian people as a nation. We are gravely concerned 
by the recent repeated public dismissal of the two-state solution by some Israeli politicians and their rejection of any international effort towards in independent Palestinian state. Gaza is an inalienable part of Palestine, and the two-state solution is the minimum dictate of international justice and the only viable path towards the settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli issue. China urges Israel to stop without delay, eroding the foundation of the two-state solution, halt the forced displacement of Palestinian civilians, and cease the searches, the arrests, and the raids in the West Bank. The historical wrongs suffered by Palestine must be righted, and Palestine's long cherished aspiration for independent statehood must be fulfilled. China supports Palestine becoming a member of the United Nations as soon as possible and calls for the convening of a larger, more authoritative, and more effective international peace conference to push for a comprehensive, just, and lasting solution to the question of Palestine. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of China for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of France. Madame la Présidente, Madam President, je remercie I wish to Monsieur, thank Monsieur Venesland Mr. Lockyer Venesland and Mr. Lockyer exposé. for their briefings. Comme l'a dit le président de la République, Emmanuel by Macron, the President of the Republic of France, Emmanuel Macron, it is essential to conclude without further delay to reach a ceasefire agreement on Gaza, which guarantees the protection of all civilians. The human toll and the humanitarian situation are catastrophic. There is a vital need to deliver en masse humanitarian assistance to the people in Gaza. In this regard, there is an imperative need to open the Ashdod port, a direct land route from Jordan, and all access points to the Strip. There is a need to spare no effort to facilitate the efforts of the Special Coordinator, Sigrid Kog. Israeli military operations need to be put to an end. France emphatically opposes the Israeli offensive in us in Rafah. Such an offensive is liable to further worsen it, the humanitarian disaster. France opposes a forced displacement of people. There is a need to have a clear principle of distinction, necessity, proportionality, and proportion upheld. France also opposes any, opposes any forced displacement of people. This would constitute a violation of international humanitarian law and would pose an additional risk of further escalation. We call for the release of all hostages immediately without preconditions. This is stipulated in resolutions 2712 and 2720. The Security Council needs to prioritize this. There is a need to firmly condemn the 7 October terrorists attacks perpetrated by Hamas and other terrorist groups. France recalls its unstinting commitment to Israeli security and our solidarity with the Israeli people in the wake of the terrorist attacks. The information about participation of UNRWA employees in the 7 October attacks are of grave significance. And France applauds the useful measures that were immediately adopted by the United Nations Secretary General. These were measures undertaken to shed light on all of the allegations, specifically the two audits which are underway. There is a vital need to restore the political horizon, to endeavor to construct a, a state for the Palestinian people, and to ensure safety and security guarantees, security guarantees for Israel. The two-state solution is the only way to establish a lasting peace. This two-state solution is imperiled specifically by Israel's illegal settlement activity, which France firmly condemns. In addition to being a major obstacle to a lasting peace, this policy stokes violence on the ground. In this regard, we are concerned about violence perpetrated by settlers in the West Bank. We impose sanctions against 28 extremist Israeli settlers who were found guilty of violence against civilians in the West Bank. The State of Israel needs to shoulder its responsibility to end this violence 
violence and uphold security for all Palestinian people in all the uh, territories which uh, uh, occupies. The stability of, uh, of, of uh, Lebanon is critical as is full respect for Resolution 1701 by all parties uh, and assistance to UNIFIL. France is working to meet the conditions for lasting de-escalation. We will also continue to shoulder responsibilities to contribute to maritime security in the Red Sea. And we will continue to resolutely engage to mobilize the Council on the humanitarian security and political aspects of the crisis. I thank, thank the you. representative of France for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of Ecuador. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to begin by thanking Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Mr. Tor Wenesland, as well as Mr. Chris Lockyer for their briefings this morning. In recent months, the item of the agenda that brings us here today, the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question, has been most active in the Security Council, and this is for good reason. Undoubtedly, the situation deserves it. During this time, we've seen thousands of painful and unacceptable deaths of innocent civilians. Ecuador expresses its solidarity with Israel and with Palestine because we value equally their lives, because we share their pain, the pain of each unnecessary death. With regard to the situation in Rafa, it's indispensable to recall that provisions of international humanitarian law must be respected at all times and by everyone. Adherence to these provisions is not voluntary, and failure to comply brings with it serious consequences. This Council has adopted two resolutions, the result of arduous negotiations with the aim of alleviating the conditions being faced by the civilian population in Gaza, in particular women and children, that account for the majority of victims. Ecuador demands full implementation of resolutions 2712 and 2720. And to this end, we believe in the necessity for a humanitarian ceasefire. We have said this on various occasions and we do this again today. Likewise, Ecuador reiterates its unequivocal condemnation of the terrorist attacks perpetrated by Hamas on the 7th of October, and we demand once again the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. Madam President, in December pasado, Last December, Venezuela, Coordinator Wenesland addressed this council and recalled to us that during the first nine months of last year, the attention of the council was focused on the West Bank. Lo que sucede en Gaza what is happening in no Gaza debe should not lead us to ignore lo que sigue what continues to happen in that region. Las actividades de asentamiento, the settlement activities, la crisis the economic crisis, y los actos and de the acts of violence persisten. continue. We are constantly witness to provocative acts and statements. Los comportamientos y declaraciones de los líderes tienen influencia en acciones de otras personas. Por eso llamamos a que demuestren responsabilidad, moderación y un genuino compromiso para evitar una expansión mayor de la violencia. Hoy, para evitar una expansión de la violencia. Today, we have to make a particular appeal for caution due to the sensitive period of the religious holidays approaching. We call for respect for the status quo of the holy sites of Jerusalem and the role of the Kingdom of Jordan as custodian. Acts of provocation in these, at these sites should be avoided at all costs. Finally, Madam President, we once again reiterate our conviction that the only way to put an end to this conflict is through a peaceful, negotiated, lasting and just solution for the parties with the existence of two states, Palestine and Israel, on the basis of the 1967 borders and pursuant to relevant resolutions. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Ecuador for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of Slovenia. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Madam President. Um, I want to thank the special coordinator, Wenesland, for his briefing. I also want to thank Mr. Lockyer for his very powerful testimony today, and I join others in expressing our support, admiration, and the condolences, of course, for loss of your staff. The Security Council meets today as a threat of incomprehensible proportions is looming over Rafa. I cannot but feel this unimaginable catastrophe is looming also over the Security Council, which has not been able yet to rally behind the call for a ceasefire, 
and for silencing the skies over Gaza and Israel. What future is waiting for us, the international community, if we continue to be indifferent to the tears of 17,000 17, unaccompanied minors having witnessed unimaginable horrors of death and destruction? What kind of the council have we become if we remain untouched by the tearful briefing that we heard today by the Secretary General of Médecins Sans Frontières? What is the future of the international community if the most fundamental principles of the international system and international humanitarian law, decades in the making, are crumbling in front of our eyes? <clears throat> I want to reiterate our deep concern over the grave violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law that we continue to witness in Gaza. From indiscriminate bombings, forced displacement, targeting of protected buildings and personnel, including hospitals and medical and humanitarian staff, to preventing the delivery of much needed humanitarian aid to the people in Gaza, including water, food, fuel, and medicine supplies. Among violations, we consider with the same gravity also taking civilian hostages, preventing ICRC to get in touch with them, and preventing delivery of medicines they urgently need. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate once again our distress over the working conditions, safety and security of medical and humanitarian personnel and UN staff in Gaza. Stories of hospital sieges and convoys, ambulances, crews, and shelters being attacked are horrifying. We applaud the courage of humanitarian, medical, and UN workers and organizations and their dedication to saving lives. Slovenia has assumed its share of responsibility to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Just today, the government of Slovenia made additional contribution to UNRWA and is committed to providing further support in the future. Tomorrow, in cooperation with Jordan, Slovenia will provide a substantial amount of in-kite assistance to Gaza. Meanwhile, the violations of international humanitarian laws are continuing unchallenged, and they are weakening the power and sanctity of the rules of war, 75 years of which we are going to mark later this year. What consequences will these violations have for the safety of humanitarian and medical personnel in other and future conflicts. Madam President, it has been almost four weeks since the ICJ order on provisional measures. It is alarming that we have not seen a change in the way military operations are carried out. On the contrary, there is a continuing threat of an imminent Israeli ground invasion of Rafah where massive civilian casualties are imminent. We are urging the Israeli government to restrain itself from carrying out such plans. We are condemning the statements and plans proposing mass displacement of Palestinians from Gaza and strongly reject them. To be clear, any displacement of the Palestinian population from Gaza could constitute another grave breach of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Like we did two days ago and on every occasion in this Council, I would like to put on record our clear condemnation of the horrific Hamas attack on 7 of October 23 and call for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. We remain hopeful about the negotiation process led by Egypt, Qatar and the United States and we thank them for their role. We expect both parties to engage in negotiations in a meaningful way and conclude them now. We have been discussing regional spillover since the start of this conflict. The messages of many countries and citizens have been clearer and sharper recent weeks. We fear this conflict is spiraling, spiraling out of control. We are observing gradually deteriorating conditions in the West Bank, along the Blue Line, in the Red Sea, but also in Syria and wider. Every conflict situation in the Middle East has its own root causes and its own spoilers. But nobody can deny that a ceasefire in Gaza would have a calming effect 
on the rest of the region. Only political solutions can bring peace and security to the whole region, and it is the responsibility of this Council to pave the way for them. The pathway to peace and to the two-state solution can only be built on an inclusive political process with a vision for the future. Slovenia continues calling for an international peace conference to address a two-state solution in a comprehensive manner. Thank you. I thank the representative of Slovenia for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of Sierra Leone. Madam President, I thank Mr. To Wenesland, Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, and Mr. Christopher Locke, Secretary General, Mercedes of Frontier, for their timely, comprehensive, but also sobering briefings. The situation in the Middle East, with specific reference to the Palestinian question, is marked by a cycle of insecurity and instability due to the unresolved ongoing occupation of the Palestinian territories. This fragility has been recently exacerbated by the 7th October 2023 attack by Hamas on Israeli civilians, which we strongly condemn. Regrettably, the current war in the Gaza Strip which has ensued continues to rage, causing grievous harm to civilians. The war in Gaza has also created instability in the Middle East region. The severity of the situation at this stage is an indication that we should be, what should be foremost amongst our priorities as a council is focusing on ending the war in Gaza and ensuring the release of all hostages held by Hamas and other harm groups. Sierra remains deeply concerned that resolutions 2712 and 2720 adopted by this council have not been fully implemented. We remain deeply concerned about the parties to the conflict consistent failure to comply with international law, particularly international humanitarian law. We are gravely concerned about the failure to protect civilians, civilian objects and humanitarian workers. The reported figures of casualties among civilians and humanitarian workers across the Gaza Strip since the 7th October 2023 attack are deeply disturbing. It is distressing to note that over 29,000 fatalities have been recorded, a greater percentage being women and children. According to UNICEF, these are not include the 1 million children in need of mental health and psychosocial support and the 17,000 children unaccompanied or separated from their parents. Our deep concern about the destruction of civilian infrastructure extends to acts of perfidy and military operations being executed in healthcare facilities, including the NASA hospital complex in Karyunis. Such actions pose threats to patients and medical personnel obligated to be protected under international humanitarian law. We recognize the bravery and commitment displayed by United Nations personnel and a host of other humanitarian and medical workers who endeavor daily to provide life-saving aid to civilians in need amidst ongoing hostilities in Gaza. To the relatives and friends of all those who have lost their lives since the start of the conflict, we express our deepest condolences. This council, however, can offer more than condolences and deep concerns. This council is mandated to do more. The collective security scheme and the responsibility that accompanies it behoves this council to do more. As we stated two days ago, we are deeply worried that over 140 days now, 130 days in the conflict in Gaza then, the Security Council was unable to adopt another resolution even with 13 affirmative votes. The resolution would have called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, demanding the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, rejecting forced displacement of the Palestinians, reiterating the call for full, rapid, safe, and unhindered humanitarian access in Gaza, and the optimal political solution of a two-state solution, which could not be adopted. Madam President, the situation in the wider Middle East region is becoming increasingly volatile as a result of the grave situation 
currently unfolding in the Gaza Strip. The fallout from the Gaza conflict is being felt throughout the Middle East and beyond. The reported incident of air raids and firing of rockets in southern Lebanon and northern Israel, respectively, is deeply concerning. The continuing maritime attacks in the Red Sea by the Houthis in Yemen must stop. Responses to the Houthis' attack must also comply with international law. The relevant resolutions of the Security Council must be respected. Given this situation, Sierra Leone has the following observations and immediate action points. Firstly, the ongoing bombardment and imminent intense military operations in the Gaza Strip with a spotlight on the impending attack on Rafa City will further worsen the current humanitarian situation being endured by civilians who cannot access basic essentials like water, food, electricity, and medical supplies. Therefore, we emphasize the need for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. <coughs> the Security Council is primarily responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security, and thus we expect this Council to adopt a resolution that unambiguously calls for a humanitarian ceasefire. Secondly, we acknowledge the ongoing diplomatic negotiations being mediated by the United States, Egypt, and Qatar and we sincerely look forward to having a positive outcome. The ongoing diplomatic neg negotiations done in good faith can complement or be complemented by a Security Council resolution that demands a full and unconditional humanitarian ceasefire and the release of all of the hostages unconditionally. Thirdly, we call on parties to the conflict to respect and comply with the 26 January 2024 order of the International Court of Justice to, inter alia, enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Fourthly, we urge Israeli settlers and Palestinians in the West Bank and other actors in the wider region to refrain from any unilateral or provocative action or activity with the potential to inflame further tensions. In closing, Madam President, Sierra Leone regrets the serious allegations based on information provided by Israel implicating 12 UNRWA staff members in the 7 October 2023 attacks in Israel. We welcome the swift action by the United Nations and the immediate activation of the investigation by the UN Office of Internal Oversight Services. We urge for a comprehensive and speedy conduct of the investigations and urge all relevant parties to comply with the investigators and cooperate with them. So I acknowledges the pivotal role played by UNRWA in providing humanitarian assistance to the 1.9 internally displaced Palestinians in the Gaza Strip but also to Palestinians in the West Bank, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. We therefore reiterate our call for the continuation of vital funding to facilitate UNRWA's indispensable operations. I thank you. I thank the representative of Sierra Leone for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Special Coordinator Tor Evansland for detailed briefing and Secretary General of MSF Christopher Lokyo for a vivid testimony that I believe touched member states in this room. The current catastrophe in Gaza started in the fall of last year and we are now heading toward spring. For a period of more than four months, civilians in Gaza have suffered excessively experienced the worst winter without adequate shelter, food, and clothes. The number of facilities in Gaza, 70% of whom are women and children, is outrageous. This tragic situation must come to an end. Over the last two weeks, the world has been gravely concerned with possible ground operations in Rafah, where more than half of the Gazan population is densely packed seeking safety and security for themselves and their children. Extensive military operations in Rafah will lead to another great calamity. This must not happen. 
and any forcible transfer of Palestinian outside Palestine, including the Gaza Strip, is simply not acceptable. Madam President, Ramadan, the holy month for Muslims, is fast approaching. Yet the situation in Gaza has, little, has seen little improvement. Indeed, more than 70% of civil infrastructures, such as homes, schools, and hospitals in Gaza, are now completely destroyed were badly damaged. More than one million children are in need of mental health support, and 17,000 children are reported have been orphaned. 2.2 million people, almost everyone in Gaza, are at imminent risk of famine. All these figures are hard to believe, but tragically, these difficult facts tell the ongoing reality for Gaza and its people. Yet we must not forget that the Israeli citizens are also suffering. More than 100 hostages are still being held in Gaza, and their family members are desperately waiting for any news of their beloved ones. Hamas and other militant groups are still firing rockets from Gaza into Israel. At the same time, regional tensions are expanding, bringing imminent danger of a greater conf conflict, con conflagration. The blue line between Israel and Lebanon is facing a constant risk of further intensification of the current armed conflict. And the attacks against vessels on the Red Sea by the Houthis are ongoing. All across the Middle East, including in Iraq and Syria, instability and tensions are at an alarming level. All actors in the region should pursue de-escalation, considering the combustible moment we collectively face. To stop the atrocities in Gaza and Israel, and to ease the perilous tensions in the region, we once again call for a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. The terrorist attacks by Hamas on the 7th of October must be resolutely condemned. But Israel's right and duty to protect itself and its citizens must be carried out in full compliance with international law, including international humanitarian law. Madam President, the Republic of Korea supports every effort to achieve a cessation of hostilities. Thus, we voted in favor of earlier, in favor of the, in favor earlier this week of the resoluting resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire. Korea also appreciates the efforts being undertaken by key stakeholders in the region, including Egypt, Qatar, and the United States to this end. Korea hopes that the hostilities will soon end. However, we are also deeply worried that even after the current situation ends, agony and sorrow will be deeply rooted in both Palestine and Israel, bearing a high risk of relapse. As such, it is high time for the international community, notably the Security Council, to realize the two-state solution, which is the only viable way toward a brighter future underpinned with peace, security, prosperity, and the dignity for all. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Republic of Korea for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of Mozambique. Madam President, Mozambique thanks the Guyana Presidency for convening this briefing on the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. We stand our deep appreciation to Mr. To Wenesline, Special Coordinator for Middle East Peace Process, for his briefing and for important work he and his team have been doing at this difficult hour. We are grateful to Mr. Christopher Lokia, Director General of the Middle East 
Médecin sans frontières, for his insight update to the Council. Madam President, the ongoing crisis in Gaza continues to be a matter of great concern to the international community as a whole. The situation is dire, with humanitarian needs escalating rapidly. The escalation of hostilities has been killing people and causing devastating consequences on critical civilian infrastructure, aggravating the humanitarian crisis that affect particularly women and children, facilitating secure and unimpeded humanitarian access across Gaza is crucial in order to save millions of lives since people depend exclusively on humanitarian assistance. Efforts to address the crisis in Gaza Strip have not been successful so far. Full implementations of Security Council resolutions will constitute a step in the right direction. In this context, Mozambique def defends the following actions. One, an immediate and urgent humanitarian ceasefire, a cessation of hostilities followed by permanent ceasefire. This is important to ensure that humanitarian aid is delivered without restriction to those in need in Gaza. Second, a strict observance of and full respect for international humanitarian law and international human rights law aimed at saving innocent civilian populations. And finally, we renew our call for an urgent implementation of two state solution for Israel and Palestine, with both living side by side as a good neighbors in accordance with the UN Charter, Security Council, and General Assembly resolutions. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Mozambique for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Algeria. Madam President, allow me to thank Mr. Winesland and Mr. Chris Lockyer. For their comprehensive conditions for the killing of the regarding the aggression Transferring 
persist in against our brothers in occupied Palestine. This will cannot be killed off with crimes of genocide and war crimes that it continues to commit in the Gaza Strip. History will remember those war criminals. The enemies of life الاقتباس. and humanity. And of course, Madam President, the situation in Gaza is at the brink of collapse. The decision of the WFP to suspend its operation in the north of the Gaza Strip is not an indication to the inevitable fate awaiting around 300,000 people that will simply not have anything to eat. We call once again for an immediate and durable ceasefire to put an end to this humanitarian tragedy. It's a demand that has become extremely urgent today as the situation continues to deteriorate. We renew our support to all United Nations agencies and all humanitarian workers that are being targeted by discrediting countries. Those are desperate attempts to destroy the basis for Palestinian resilience on Palestinian land. It is completely unacceptable to threaten to attack Rafah and to prevent the delivery of humanitarian aid using flimsy pretexts to strip Palestinians of their dignity and to push them to leave their land once again. We completely reject any plot to forcibly displace Palestinians. من مخاطر الإجراءات المتخذة للحد من وصول الفلسطينيين للمسجد الأقصى خلال شهر رمضان المبارك. إنها إجراءات تهدد بإشعال الوضع أكثر وخروجه عن السيطرة. ونؤكد على ضرورة احترام الوضع القانوني والتاريخي بالمسجد الأقصى المبارك وعلى ضوء الوصاية الهاشمية الأردنية على المقدسات الإسلامية والمسيحية وأن المسجد الأقصى Holy site, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, with its area of 144 dunams, is a place of worship exclusively for Muslims. رفضنا لمخططات التقسيم الزماني والمكاني للأقصى المبارك. سيدة رئيس، إنه لا يحل للقضية الفلسطينية إلا بإقامة الدولة الفلسطينية وتمكين الشعب الفلسطيني من جميع حقوقه المشروعة وغير القابلة للتصالح. أود أن أختم بما جاء في رسالة رئيس الجمهورية السيد عبد المجيد تبون بمناسبة اليوم العالمي للتضامن مع الشعب الفلسطيني. International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. I quote: Algeria has paid dearly for its independence and sovereignty. On Algeria's land, 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 on courage of the Palestinian people until it's granted its full rights undiminished. I thank the representative of Algeria for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of Guyana. I thank Special Coordinator Wenselan for his very sobering briefing, which presented the grim realities on the ground. I thank you, Mr. Lockyer, for your frankness, even in the face of possible reprisals. We also offer our condolences on the loss of life, of the lives of your colleagues, and we salute the bravery of those who continue to operate, bringing service to Gaza in these very trying times. Guyana is deeply, deeply disturbed that this council has been unable to unite to secure relief for the Palestinian people from a war relentless in scope and scale and which has driven the population of Gaza to unprecedented levels of desperation and loss. The blatant disregard for international law, including for obligations stemming from international instruments to which the occupying power is party, is wholly unacceptable. Equally unacceptable is the manner in which words have been toyed with on this council to deny the Palestinians what they so desperately need at this time, a ceasefire. 
and all of this amidst growing international outrage over the paralysis of the Council to deliver fully on its mandate. Palestinians in Gaza have been pushed from the north to the very south of the Strip, forcibly displaced many times over, killed and injured in the process, and with no means of escape. They have now been cornered in Rafa, faced with the impossible choice of a forced transfer outside of Gaza or becoming the targets of the instruments of war. The Council has to stand up now for Gaza. Colleagues, we know the conditions in Gaza. We have heard more about this this morning. We know that the population is starving and suffering in the cold. We know how women and children are disproportionately affected by this senseless war. We know that the healthcare system has broken down with essential medical supplies not allowed in at scale and hospitals, the targets of military operations. Humanitarian supplies into Gaza are subject to slow and stringent verification processes with only a trickle of aid entering the Strip. Desperation among the population is therefore high. As we think about Gaza, we are deeply concerned whenever we consider the psychological trauma on top of everything else that people are experiencing. We think of the children. Each time we meet here to discuss Gaza, we hear of misery on top of misery on top of misery. What else needs to happen before we are compelled to end this misery for the people in Gaza? Guyana also acknowledges with sadness the many UN and other humanitarian personnel whose lives have been lost in the war. We also recognize those who continue to give selfless service under these extremely difficult conditions and stress that their safety and security should be equally concerning to us as a council. The funding cuts to UNRWA are also having a detrimental impact given the critical work of the agency both in Gaza and in the West Bank. For us, these cuts are tantamount to collective punishment for the Palestinian people. Guyana appeals for the restoration of funding for UNRWA and for other donors to scale up funding to the agency. We have made our own contribution just recently. The events in Gaza are having a tremendous impact on an already volatile region, creating legitimate concerns about a regional conflagration. Guyana calls on all parties to exercise restraint and to refrain from actions that would only further exacerbate the situation in the region. The Security Council, Council's actions must match the level of urgency. People are depending on us to stay alive. We need to send a strong and unequivocal message that this Council does not support the violations of international law taking place in Gaza. Colleagues, Guyana urges this Council to safeguard the rights and dignity of the Palestinian people, in particular their right to a state of their own and to live in peace and security away from the shadows of war. I resume my function as President of the Council. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. I now invite council members to informal consultations to continue our discussion on the subject. The meeting is adjourned.